The study of ecology can help us solve a number of real-world problems, one of which is hunger. If your family or your community or your country faces the threat of starvation, what's the best strategy uh, to get the most out of your food? Should you eat lots of meat? Should you eat lots of grains, fruits and vegetables, or a mixture of all of them? Well, in this video, we're going to trace the flow of energy in ecosystems so that we can better understand how to answer that question. Let's start by defining ecosystem. An ecosystem is simply all of the living and non-living things in an area. And a more technical term for living is biotic. A technical term for non-living is abiotic. So in this particular ecosystem, some biotic components would be bacteria and plankton and insects and termites, whereas abiotic, non-living features would be sunlight, the air, the water, the soil. So for energy flow, we're going to focus on how energy moves through the living parts of an ecosystem. And we can show this using a food chain. So in this food chain, we have a simplified way of tracing energy through an ecosystem. And a food chain always has arrows. Those arrows are showing the direction that energy moves. So this organism is being eaten by this organism. Thus, energy is moving from this organism into this organism. Similarly, this organism is being eaten by this organism, so energy is flowing from the mouse to the snake. And again, energy then flows from the snake to the hawk when the hawk eats the snake. And each of these positions in the food chain is known as a trophic level or feeding role. Troph always refers to food. So let's look in more detail at these different trophic levels. And we're going to look at the trophic levels in a terrestrial food chain that we would find on land and an aquatic food chain that we would find in water. The first trophic level of the food chain is the producer level. These are either plants or phytoplankton slash algae that can convert sunlight into food. The next level in the food chain are the primary consumers. These organisms eat the producers. So a grasshopper eats the plant and the zooplankton eats the phytoplankton. The next level is secondary consumers. They eat the primary consumers. And then we have tertiary consumers. They eat the secondary consumers. And sometimes we'll even have quaternary consumers, which eat the tertiary consumers. Now, sometimes you'll hear these trophic levels go by different names. For example, an organism that consumes plants is also known as an herbivore. And organisms that consume other animals are known as carnivores. So secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consumers are all carnivores. Now, this food chain is a bit of a simplification, though, because in reality, uh, feeding relationships are more complex. And a food web does a better job of showing the complex relationships in an ecosystem. As you can see from this food web, um, most species have more than one food source. Uh, this animal can eat multiple types of plants. Uh, similarly, this hawk hunts various types of animals. And so a food web shows all those connections. Also, sometimes species can occupy more than one trophic level. For example, uh, this bird is both a secondary and a primary consumer, which is known as an omnivore. An omnivore can eat plants or it can eat animals. Humans are omnivores. And this leads us to an important principle. The more diverse the ecosystem, generally the more stable it is. And comparing food chains and food webs helps us understand that. If we look at a simple food chain, if this is how the ecosystem really looks, the ecosystem is not very diverse. And let's say something terrible happens and all the mice are removed from the ecosystem. Well, the food chain is probably going to collapse because now there's nothing to eat the insects. So the insects are going to overpopulate and probably eat up all the plants. 
Meanwhile, the snake has nothing to eat, so it will die out, and the hawk population will then die out because it has nothing to eat. However, if the ecosystem is complex and looks more like a food web, if that same mouse species disappears, well, the organisms have other food sources, and there's less likely to be long-lasting harm to the ecosystem. Now, we can quantify the diversity in an ecosystem using pyramids. This is a pyramid of numbers. It simply shows how many organisms belong to each trophic level. So in this ecosystem, there are almost 6 million producers, 708,000 um, primary consumers, and only three tertiary consumers. So you'll notice a trend. Um, Producers are generally the most abundant, and the further up the food chain you go, the fewer and fewer organisms you find. So the top level consumers will generally be the least abundant in an ecosystem. Similarly, we can also show this with a pyramid of biomass. In a pyramid of biomass, we're showing how much mass of each trophic level is present. So again, we see a similar trend, which is that the producers, the plants, have the most biomass, whereas the top level consumers, the top carnivores, have the least biomass. Now you might be wondering, why is this the case? Why are there more producers than carnivores in an ecosystem? Well, it has to do with the fact that we can't create or destroy energy, and we can't create or destroy matter. So where does it go? Well, in an ecosystem, this diagram shows us what energy is doing and what the chemicals are doing. So we can see that chemicals are being recycled in this ecosystem. So this plant is made of chemicals, and those chemicals get transferred to the grasshopper when the grasshopper eats it. And those chemicals then get transferred to the mouse when the mouse eats the grasshopper. When the mouse dies, decomposers will break down the dead mouse and return those chemicals to the soil, which can then become part of the plant again. So chemicals are recycled. Energy, however, does not get recycled. Energy flows. So energy starts in the form of sunlight. Producers convert it uh, into glucose and other carbohydrates. And then some of that energy gets transferred to the grasshopper when it eats the plant. However, the grasshopper has to use some of that energy to keep itself alive, and it gives off some heat. So only some energy will be left for the mouse when the mouse eats the grasshopper. And again, the mouse is going to have to use some of the energy from its food to keep its body going, and it's going to give off some energy as heat. So when it dies and is broken down by the decomposers, there's only some energy left. So this is an important point. Energy is not recycled. It flows because some of it gets used by the organism and some of it is given off to the environment as heat. And so this leads us to our final pyramid, a pyramid of energy. And here what we're seeing is the amount of energy available at each tropic level. And in this case, we're measuring energy in terms of kilocalories. Now, let's say that in sunlight, there's a million kilocalories of energy. Plants can only convert about 1% of that into glucose and other carbohydrates. And then, as you move up the trophic levels, uh, each organism or each level can only get about 10% of the energy from the previous level. 90% of the energy in this level is going to be used by the plant for its own metabolism or given off as heat. Similarly, 90% of the energy in the primary consumers are going to be used by the consumers for their own needs or given off as heat. And this is why there are so few tertiary consumers. By the time it's time for a tertiary consumer to eat, there is very little energy left in the ecosystem that it can actually consume and use. So you'll rarely see anything above the quaternary level because there's just no more energy left. The rest of it has been used by other trophic levels or wasted as heat. And so this should help you understand and come up with a better answer to the question of how best to solve a problem like world hunger.